Good morning, everyone. And thank you for coming out. I know there are a lot of hot talks at 10.45, so I'm grateful that you've ended up in here instead of elsewhere. Uh, my name is Alice Leach. I'm a data engineer at Whatnot. And for some reason, I chose to title this extreme self-service. I think I may regret it now, but we're going to talk about the rock and roll version of self-service that we have tried our best to implement at Whatnot. So it can be helpful to understand the kind of data problems that we're facing. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Whatnot itself. Whatnot is a live stream shopping platform. So what that means is we have sellers who go live and buyers can bid on their products live on the application. Um, it's the fastest growing marketplace in the US for two years in a row. And we sell in about 80, probably more than that, even as I speak, product categories right now. So growth is awesome and we're very lucky to be growing, but it can lead to challenges. So with growth comes lots and lots and lots of data needs, and we're a very small data team. So um, we have always ascribed to the kind of self-service nature of a data platform to make sure everyone gets what they need as fast as possible. And so we were maintaining what I would, would call a regular Again, the adjectives beyond me, but a regular self-service platform. So people were accessing data, they were running queries, building dashboards, generating reports. And what we were finding were we were receiving more and more and more and more ad hoc requests to the data engineers. Can you build me this new data set? Can you productionize this report that I built? I want it to be CEO worthy and always, always kind of accurate. Um, they wanted to generate new data and immediately have it in the Snowflake database and be able to push data out to the, the tools that they were using kind of up front. And so we began to ask ourselves, how can we allow people to do this immediately without us interfering, if you will? How can we stay out of their way? And the three ways we've tried to do this are building a community in SQL literacy, establishing and sharing best practices and building robust guardrails. I'm going to go into each of these, um, but before I do so, it's really, really important to understand who is actually using your data platform before you start launching into trying to get them to do things by themselves. Um, so while all of our users are unique and special, um, we can typically associate them with one of three buckets. And so they're down on the left-hand side there. So we have our business stakeholders. This could be, you know, the head of our Lego category. And what she wants to know is, is that category successful? Is it growing every day? How many people have bought in that category? How many sellers do they have? Have they churned anyone in the last 24 hours? So that's a business stakeholder and they need to know what's going on in their zone in great detail. We also have the kind of analytics and machine learning team persona. They are more interested in kind of deeper questions. So perhaps our machine learning team might want to know what order they, they rank the feeds in today. Um, and they might want to build a model to do that. Um, our analytics team might be interested in cus customer engagement across the platform. Who's clicking where, when, and why? Are people interacting with a new feature? Similarly, our software engineers who build the features themselves, they might want to know, is their new feature being adopted? They might be building up a seller dashboard. They may need access to that data quickly and with low latency. And while they don't necessarily map one-to-one, -one, we found that with those personas, with those consumers, um, we were able to kind of bucket them into three goals for us to have as constructors, as people who are building their own and, and meeting their own data needs. So with that in mind, we have our data insight developers. Um, they are generating da data assets. They're building dashboards that are production level. Um, they're using tools like Snowflake, Sigma, and Retool, and they need to be intimately familiar with SQL. We also have our data product developers. These are people who might be building out new data sets. They're people who might be building machine learning models. Um, they need to know DBT, they need to interact with our event schema registry, and we would say that that group of people needs to have advanced SQL skills. And here with advanced SQL, I'm kind of talking about largely efficiency. Can they make a table that doesn't just give them the data that they need, but it gives it, them, gives it to them without the query taking 12 hours in our data warehouse? So the last thing, the last persona, if you will, that we wanted from a data constructor was a pipeline developer. 
If someone generates a new table in our main backend, can they get it through to Snowflake immediately and without too many issues? So if I have all these data constructors, you might ask, what, what the hell is the data engineering team doing if everyone can do it themselves? And I wish the answer was taking a nap, but unfortunately, it's not. And what I think the data team's role is at whatnot is to define and minimize the interactive surfaces that these constructors are using and then unblock users completely on those surfaces so they can do everything as quickly as possible and with ease and clear definition. So now we know who's doing it and what we want them to be doing, um, we can look a bit closer at how we chose to do that. So the first thing that you might notice is at least two of these personas need to be intimately familiar with SQL. So the first thing we wanted to do um, was build out a community of data users and encourage SQL literacy across the entirety of our company. So the first thing that I think that you need to do that is have executive support. And we are extremely lucky that our executives thoroughly believe that anyone, anyone in our company can write SQL. We give immediate read-only access to Snowflake and we expect anyone who arrives to write a SQL query within their first week. So how do we do that? Well, we do need to provide some educational content here to encourage upskilling. You'll see at the left-hand side of the screen, we have a learning SQL uh, course available through our Looms and Slab. And anyone is available to immediately head in and get a beginner's crash course into SQL um, along to kind of more advanced your window functions um, available there immediately. We also hold office hours to answer any questions. We have a bank of common SQL queries that you can just copy and paste if you're in a department that uses that one query to obtain data. And we try and send out weekly data announcements just to keep us in people's mind constantly. <laughs> so as a case study, um, it can be useful to hear like a specific example. Um, so one of the things that we did to try and keep us fresh in people's minds um, was a month-long initiative called Back to School. And um, what we did was, much like the email marketers that we all know and love, is we spammed people with SQL queries. Um, so everyone on the data team took a day of the month, um, and we ended up with three days each, and we sent out a SQL tip of the day. It was usually something we were working on ourselves, so it didn't take too long to do. Um, and we were able to just keep fresh in people's minds who we were and uh, what kind of questions that they could be answering with SQL. So the next thing that we chose to do to try and upskill and keep people building our data products uh, was we introduced best practices. And the one thing I would say to everyone there is lead by example. You can't make people do anything. I learned that as a high school teacher. And uh, it is also true in a, a large company or a small company. So, but what you can do is you can lead by example and you can make it as easy as possible for people to follow your example. So with that in mind, we try and provide SLAs for everything that we do. Uh, we built out a core data mart using um, the kind of SQL that we would hope other people use. So we have that um, in a DBT GitHub repo so everyone can see it. Um, and we try and provide utilities and macros wherever possible. So people can use functions that already exist or macros that already exist um, to generate things that they might need to do every day. The other thing that we did, and Zach will be talking about later today, my colleague over there, um, is we tried to streamline schema changes as much as possible. So anytime that a software engineer created a new table or added a new event, um, we can propagate that change all the way through to the data warehouse as easily as possible with them only interacting with the event schema registry surface. The other thing that we try to provide is templates and documentation. So we have Slab um, and we provide Wikipedia kind of style articles about our data products and how to's wherever possible. We also keep an archive of example PRs. Lots of people have done things already. So we're able to use those examples to show perhaps how we would want them to be done again. The last thing is we encourage as far as possible everyone to use observability and testing. So we have opt-in defaults. Would you like alerting? Yes, here are the suite of tests that we're going to add. 
Um, and we also use Slack-based alerting. Everyone's in Slack all day anyway. It might as well be the place that we send data alerts to them. The last thing that I would say when it comes to best practices is as a data team, we want to own as little as possible. So while it would be lovely if I could look after all 900 tables in our DBT repo, that is not a physical possibility, but we do need to know who owns them and um, how to contact them. Okay, with that in mind, here's a quick case study that we use for our best practices. We recently went international. You need to convert currencies. There are a lot of ways to get that wrong. I met some of them. <laughs> so what we did was we provided a macro in DBT so that all you have to do is give it the list of columns that you want to convert to US dollars and it will do it for you. The last thing that I wanted to touch on was robust guardrails. Again, we can't make people do what we want them to do, but we can try and stop them from doing what we really, really don't want them to do. So the biggest thing that I would say on this slide is CICD. You really want a robust CICD process in every repo that you have. Um, we use a combination of pre-commit, linting, and stage testing um, to try and avoid things getting pushed into our main production level services um, that create issues. Uh, the other thing that I think we found really powerful is uh, setup and access. So making it very, very, very easy for a developer to start interacting with the surface that we've chosen for them to interact with, whether that be the event schema registry or the DBT repo. Um, and that's done by using a combination of make files and then infrastructure as code and single sign-on. So we use Okta for access. Um, Maintenance-wise, again, we can't own everything. Um, so it's become very important with ownership to have a team tag. And a team tag will direct alerting immediately to a Slack channel um, and allow us to notify people when things are, go wrong, are going wrong instead of trying to fix it ourselves. The last thing to touch on is cleanup. When you let people develop whatever they want, they abandon it. <laughs> so we had a lot, a lot, a lot of issues with dead tables. And so we generated um, a, a cleanup pr process that goes through Snowflake and deletes anything that no longer has an owner or hasn't been used uh, in greater than 30 days. As an example, I want to give you an overview of the process that we're currently using for CICD in the DBT repo. We have about 50 developers in the DBT repo um, and we average about 10 pull requests a day. So what goes on here um, is a PR can be created when it's marked ready for review we're going to immediately merge the main branch into that uh, PR. We're going to lint the files, and then we're going to, in parallel, run a stage run and a pre-commit equivalent. We use dbt checkpoint for that. Then we send the results to the PR. Um, a code reviewer will take a look. If it's approved, we can go ahead and merge the PR. And then we will run a job on merge, a dbt compile, and use that to compare to the next CI run um, to allow us to stay as up to date as possible. So what are we doing in the future? Well, we really need to take another look at our continuous deployment procedure. It takes too long. People are frustrated by that. We also need to work on modularity. We have a lot of interdependent models, which we would really prefer to be separate. Um, and uh, we need to keep a better eye on our query monitoring. So preventing those 12 hour queries from creeping into our projects. As a quick takeaway, I would treat your data platform like a theme park. Disney World, if you will. Everybody is welcome. We have guardrails, we don't have gates. Keep the lines short, keep the rides running, have fun and be nice. Thank you.